Wow, this is such a treat for us to see your research, especially for us. The, the Filipino that you're seeing in, in the group is Roderick Javier. He's also working with Philippine history. So he's a co-faculty in Pinil. So we're the only school in the Philippines that teaches a dedicated AB photography program. So that's why we're, we're so amazed with all of these stories because before finding your, your article, the two of us also were working on the story or the narrative of Guardiola. So probably later we can talk about that further. No? For now, let me react first to, to the initial part of your presentation. I know this is a historical, ethnographic, uh, cultural presentation that you did. However, in you holding the photo of, of Itir in the same place, so you are juxtaposing the, the original, the stereotype image as uh, opposed to how it looks like right now. It, it feels so mystical to imagine how light would have felt, how was the phenomenological aspect of that light hitting that place when it was taken, and now looking at it, you you went there, you you photographed it with your hand stretched with the older version. It feels a bit mystical in the sense that you were playing around. <laughs> I'm, I'm a very mystical person. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not the first time we've seen historical photographs, but yours is a bit on a different level because just like what you said, uh, depending on the country, what you were holding in your hand was the first time that photography manifested itself in that place, in Asia. Yeah, it's, the, it's the image that allows to see the furthest back in time. So it's not about being the first. It's mm -hmm. about seeing the furthest back in time. Um, and it's because, I mean, I came to history of photography because of my interest in theory and phenomenology. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really looked at history of photography from that perspective, rather than just documenting. I hope that uh, Han Feng can, <laughs> can certify for this. Uh, I was really trying to, uh, it was a 12 weeks course in which of course there was a lot of historical element aspects, but I was always trying to bring that, um, that theoretical phenomenological uh, dimension forward. Uh, the question of what is photography actually doing beside making images? How is it? Messing up with time and space, with our perception of time and space. That's like really my... Maybe later, Gilles, we can go back to the theory part. For now, let me comment first on the aspect of your work in terms of uh, judging from the people who join us uh, for today. I think most of us are in the academia or professional historians. But for those who might see the, this video or this recording who are not aware of or are new to your research, it, it would feel innocuous. It, it would feel very simple. And yet, when viewed at a grander scale, what you are showing is actually, first and foremost, the history of not just of photography, but a history of the world. And part of it would be the not necessarily just the circumnavigation of the camera, but the first time that the world will be able to see itself through a photograph. So well, yeah, yeah, the, the, the whole collection of images that he gathered and brought back mm -hmm. uh, was indeed, yeah, the first time that the world was holding a mirror looking at itself because it was covering um, a large part of the world. Um, it's interesting that he, that he he didn't use the camera in Brazil. He didn't use it in South Africa, which is a pity. Uh, but that's probably because he was like very preciously keeping his, that, his plate for China. Because we saw in the list of, um, of places visited that China really took the bulk of the plates. Because that's where he was really, and the, the mission was a mission to China. China was fascinating Europe at the time. And there, was, there had been that whole passion for chinoiserie in the 18th century. Uh, the trading with China, with all the Chinoiserie and also. So China was really fascinating Europe. So this is what he really um, wanted to share. It's, he, there are only three plates used as a um, frontispiece in the journal, one for each volume of the journal. Unfortunately, there are no traces of his correspondence with the publisher. Um, I believe that if there are only three plates used, it's purely for practical economical reason. Uh, 
uh, turning a daguerreotype into an engraving and printing it is costly. And I believe that the publisher uh, was not keen in spending uh, more money on the book. So they used only one plate for each volume. But I'm quite, I'm quite convinced that Etier would, if he had been able to use more illustrations in the, in the book, he would have done it. And there we would have really that, it would be, I mean, we would have like really a comprehensive uh, view of the world, you see, with, um, with this reproduction in the journal. He also highlighted the aspect of ETA almost being the uh, precursor for photojournalism. Would you like to expand on that? Was there anyone else who was doing a photograph as well as combining it with text? Yeah, I mean, it's something, I mean, we know how, like, for example, there are those photographs of the, of the Mexican war, daguerreotypes of the Mexican war, which are done at, which are done at, at about the same time, okay? Um, the first daguerreotype that can be really regarded as a photojournalistic use is uh, daguerreotypes of a barricade, Rue Saint-Maur. And I think this is 1848 or something like that. It's a little later, okay? Whereby it's during the Commune, uh, during the uprising in Paris. And there is a daguerreotype of a barricade in Rue Saint-Maur, which is published in the newspaper L'Illustration, which is like the famous illustrated newspaper, weekly newspaper in France. Uh, so that daguerreotype is turned into an engraving and published in L'Illustration in relation to a political context within a few days. So we have something that is really a form of photojournalism in action. What I'm saying about those daguerreotypes of uh, Da Nang, of Vietnam, the whole thing takes place over a much longer period of time. But because between the publishing, between the shooting, very eventful shooting, I'm not gonna go into detail, but he basically almost missed the boat because he must absolutely take the photograph that will authenticate what he's talking about. So he's like really seeing the photograph as a proof of what he's going to write about, okay? And because of that, because he, uh, the, the, the bishop is going to be uh, free, uh, but he hasn't taken the photograph. So he asked to be taken on land last minute to take those two shots. And while taking the two shots, the boat is leaving. So he almost <laughs> missed the boat, okay? So it's a very eventful shooting. The daguerreotype of the fort is not ex exotic. It's not attractive as such. And we've seen the daguerreotype. It's really not the kind of image that can make fantasize about the mystery and the exotica of Asia. The other two volumes are illustrated with view of uh, Canton, which carries the whole exotica. That view of the fort doesn't say anything exotic about Vietnam. But it says something very precise about the weak state of defense of the Vietnamese military system in Da Nang. And his journal, he says very clearly, one regiment would be enough to take Da Nang, cut the north from the south, and we can be in control of the whole country. So the image is used as a frontispiece very precisely in relation to a political analysis of the situation, okay? And then about a little less than 10 years later, his secretary during the mission publishes an article in L'Illustration about two travelers in China. And he's going to illustrate the article with a reproduction of the three engraving from the journal. So that view of the fort in Da Nang is eventually distributed through the media, in the published media in a widely circulated newspaper. <clears throat> so it is an image that really presents the three steps of what will make a reportage over a half, more than half a century later, okay? Um, and he's very clear about the need for him to cover we saw eh, how the, the, the photograph in Singapore with those four 
daguerreotypes that mark the beginning of his documentation of the trip in Asia, he covers almost every single topics that make reportage. So he doesn't expand on that in the journal. He doesn't write extensively about why he's doing it, okay? But we can see that he's very clear. He's very clear about what he's doing. And what is very interesting is that quote at the end, and that, that line at the end of the, of, the, <clears throat> of the volume one, in which he questions the phenomena of daguerreotypes, okay? It's not just not making images, is using a mysterious tool that does something to the world. Just like he, with that mission, is doing something to the world in terms of globalization and so on. Most of your presentation focused on the Asian part of ETR's travel. I'm curious that why did it have to be the French? I'm curious what was happening in photography in, in Europe. Just accidental. <laughs> it's a confluence of events. I mean, to me, the invention of photography is universal. The first, it's a phenomenon. Photography is based on a natural phenomenon, the phenomenon of the pinhole. The first known description of the pinhole phenomenon is by Motsu in China, fifth century BCE. Then we move to Persia, 10th century with Halazen. Halazen fully understand the phenomenon from a physical science point of view. He describes it and he builds the first camera. And then that goes to Europe with the Renaissance when it started being used, the camera obscura for drawing purpose and so on, okay? What is very interesting is that in the 18th century, all the elements that, can, that will make photography in the 19th century are already there. Optic, chemistry, the concept of mirror image of the world, all those elements are there, but nobody brings them together. It's only at the threshold of the 19th century that suddenly, and this is, this is beautifully expanded by Jeffrey Batchen in his book, Burning with Desire. Suddenly at the turn of the 19th century, it's as if all over the world, the desire to photograph emerged. So it's not a specifically French thing. It just happened to be all over the world. It's something that, I mean, one of the most telling, uh, one of the most telling story, okay, he happens to be French. Uh, it, um, Gilles, c'est Hercule Florence. Voilà, Hercule Florence. Okay, my old name when I'm getting confused with. Hercule Florence invents photography all by himself alone in a very remote part of Brazil in 1833, way before Daguerre does it. Okay, he does it after Nibs in 1826 in France. Okay, he does it on his own because, and it's a bit like Nibs because Nibs started researching photography in order to develop the technique of possible mechanical reproduction by light, okay? And Hercule Florence does the same thing because he's in a part of Brazil where there are no printing facilities and he needs to print things. So he started researching a way of doing it in a chemical process. And he ends up inventing photography. And he even used the word photography in his journal in 1833. Years before Herschel, because the general acceptation is that the word photography is coined by Herschel in 1843 after the development um, in 1831 or something like that, anyway, the dates like that, after Talbot does the calotype. Herschel coined the word, Talbot called the calotype, okay? The name of Talbot's invention is the calotype. Herschel suggests to call the full process positive, negative, Photography in 1841 or two, something like that. Alors, yeah, it's a matter of who announced it first, as you say, Jesse, because Hercule Florence was desperately trying to get his invention recognized, writing to Academia. And he happens to be French, but this is just accidental, okay? What matters is that he was alone in a very remote part of Brazil, completely away from any other form of influences on that topic, okay? So he was really trying to get his invention recognized by academia all over the world, okay? He was completely ignored. And it's only recently, uh, there was a beautiful exhibition about him because he was originally from Monaco, Nice, uh, Hercule Florence. There was a beautiful exhibition in the museum in Monaco 
on the whole journey of uh, Florence that was extensively researched um, by an uh, Italian uh, historian who actually found in the archives of the Milan Academia letters in which he, uh, Florence was asking for recognition of his invention. Okay. So I think it's, is there a cultural part to why it is so? I don't think so. I personally, I don't think that it's something culturally defined. It just happened to be that confluence of events. I mean, why is it Itier who does that in, 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 uh, in Asia? It's because he's sent on a mission, which is part of the colonial expansion of the 19th century. And that colonial episode of the 19th century, we are still trying to deal with the, the after effect of it. Okay, it's like, it really lingers around. Uh, it happened, uh, so it's not about denying it. It's not about, to me, it's about, yeah, it's what made the world a smaller place. It's what made the world what it is today. Um, and we have, to, we have to deal with it. Uh, and it's just, it's just, it's actually, if you think about it, it's actually a very brief moment in history because it's like really 18th, because we say, yeah, it starts in the 16th century with the Spanish and the Portuguese, but it's not yet coloni colonialism. They are basically open, the Spanish a bit more, but the Portuguese are mostly opening trading posts. Malacca is not a colony. Malacca is a trading post. They don't venture beyond the walls. It's really 17th, late 17th century, 18th century, that we come into that form of uh, colonialist politics, okay? And 19th century, then we come into like full-fledged. This is when the Dutch create a government to rule in Indonesia. This is when the British, the beginning, it's a commercial trading company. It's by late 18th century that it becomes part of the empire, okay? So it's basically two centuries, which in the grander scheme of things, you know, it's like, but it is a moment when everything tip off and everything tip off, I believe because of that, that passage from the old world to the new world. And what really materializes that threshold between the old world and the new world is the apparition of photography, the apparition of technological memory, because the world begins to tell its own story by holding a mirror to itself. And this is going to be appropriated very quickly as the conference showed us in Quebranly recently. It's something that very quickly is going to be appropriated all over the world, you see? That's, my, that's how I feel. <laughs> I remember our conversation last night. I'm trying to remember what you said last night and also what, how you have explained it right now. Is it right to say, or at least can it be said that photography by essence is pre-photographic. I think this was our conversation last night. If 1839 was the official public announcement, there has been the concept of photography since, since the Chinese, yeah. or in, since pri prior to- it's the there, it's in, You see, it's, it's there in the air, but it's a matter of, there is that moment in time where, you know that 18th century, the knowledge of optics is there. The camera obscura is a very, very well-known, very, uh, very really well spread device. The knowledge in chemistry about light sensitive materials, silver sensitive to mara, is there. And 1760, there is that fundamental text by Tiffen de la Roche in his book, in his book um, Gifanti, in which he gives, a, he gives the exact description of what photography will be half a century in the, with the collodion, a metal, a glass plate coated with a viscous substance presented to a scene for a very brief moment, taken into a dark room for one hour. When you bring it out, you have an exact image, mirror image of the world, okay? So everything is there, except that he doesn't think of using the camera, which is nonetheless a very common, widely distributed device. So that says how much it was a matter of a moment in time for all that direction, all those, it's an evolution, all those ideas to come really come and gel together to surface suddenly 
at the turn of the, <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the painters were using the camera to paint. <laughs> so, um, so it's that threshold to me. Uh, okay, I have that, since we go into that, I have that paper of mine in which I make the parallel between the history of photography and the history of quantum mechanics. Oops, the big word has been thrown. <laughs> History of photography, history of quantum mechanics, very serious paper published by Doug Ritter, peer review, blah, 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 blah. No photography, no quantum mechanics, no electronics, no computer, no world as it is today. So it's, and photo, when I talk about photography, I talk about it as the first manifestation of what I call technological memory. We move from one form of organic memory, which is painting, drawing, to a technological memory in which the world reproduces itself. And, and as I was saying, I suggest that because the technological memory produces duplicata of a quantum of energy, a moment in time, whether it's visual or sonic, to make the parallel, to really have an idea of what photography did, we have to make the parallel with the phonograph. It's actually a bit amusing for us to have this conversation, also like uh, our conversation last night. Uh, in a way, you mentioned that you are an accidental historian, you're an accidental philosopher. Uh, you started with your, your artistic work from there because you wanted to explore further. Then it, it brought you to history, it brought you to philosophy, it brought you to quantum mechanics. And I think for those who, who really have the sense of inquiry when it comes to inquiring what is photography. I think it is not very far-fetched. I mean, I mentioned to you last night also, in my case, I was, I'm also trying to write something about uh, a valence theory of photography, but that's still so raw. But nevertheless, I think what you have to emphasize is that in, in photography, there is no way for you to, to manage having photography connect to other fields of discourse or other fields of of human experience where, for example, in the case of Itir, you emphasize that first and foremost, he was a soldier. So it was a diplomatic mission, it was a commercial mission. And yet when he made those photographs, he was able to touch on everything, culture, technology, geography, uh, all of those things. And I think that's a certain characteristic that also connects you to Itir. There is something that he started when he, he went into photography, everything just exploded. In your case, I see a similarity where you were doing- I mean, If I go into details, there are a number of really incredible coincidences, which are not coincidences between his life and my life, actually. I think, Sergey, do you have a question? I get some. Yes, yes Sergey. Bonsoir, Monsieur Hill. Oui. Uh, uh, two reactions, actually, uh, regarding the technological aspect. I was surprised that you mentioned that this uh, the photograph is a, is a it's a record of sunlight which struck that object at that moment in time. Because when I was researching uh, Professor Martyr, uh, one, one of the older photographers here, one of the mistakes of the snapshot, even if it was a snapshot, was that I saw it as something, not just something like, okay, this is a, a record of time, but to be precise, it is exactly that moment of sunlight at one hand captured at one two hundredth of a second, which struck those people, which struck those objects, say in 1953. So yeah. that, that was... That was part of the mistake. So yes, I, so I guess that was a valid, a, a valid observation. At that time, I, I could not even uh, make ends, heads or tails out of it because you know, actually, actually, there's, there's, there's one point. If you go deeper into the whole topic, yes. and you go into quad, the yes. quantum electron, electrodynamic. I mean, you know that theory of light, of yes. the, the way the photon works. Um, Actually, the photon is, we always say that light bounces off the subject. In fact, light doesn't bounce off the subject. Light hits the subject. It is absorbed by the surface of the subject that releases another photon carrying the information of that surface. So what the camera actually records is something of the essence of that of the subject there were you know like the, that that belief like 19th century scientists were make, uh, making fun of primitive people who were afraid that the camera was going to re, to steal their soul and not just the primitive people i think that 
I think it's, uh, who's that? There's a famous French, I think it's not Balzac or is it Baudelaire? Anyway, there's one of the famous, I think it's Baudelaire who was, who was equally- I think it was Balzac. Afraid, eh? I believe it was Balzac. It's Balzac, eh? Balzac was equally, equally afraid of his soul being stolen by the camera. But then when in 1960-70, we came to the Qued uh, theory of light, then that belief suddenly made sense because the camera actually, what the camera duplicate, and that's what I, 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 I suggest that we should use the word duplicording rather than using the word recording for what the camera and all other technological memory devices do, okay? Because those devices, they duplicate the quantum of energy, whether it's electromagnetic or mechanic or light and sound, okay? And this energy becomes a recording and they act on very different way. So yeah, the light, well, thank you so much for bringing that. It's a quote that you saw from the 1956, you said? I was looking at this old photograph. So they're basically snapshots. Uh, they're basically stuff that you send in photo camera club competitions. So mm -hmm. they're basically eye candy. But then again, when I look at them closely, even if I include the snapshots that went along with them, there's this element there that is not just a record. It is not just a likeness. It is not just... Uh, something. It is indeed uh, something from that time itself that when the photographs yeah. were taken, uh, uh, the the photons or what, whatever you call them of light, which uh, went through the lens and struck the silver, the the the, the agentic in, in the in the in the emotion. Yeah, or even whatever. I mean, even even in, uh, uh, yes. you actually so, connect with the light of that moment. Yeah. So when when you when you mention that um, phenomenological uh, aspect. Suddenly, suddenly, what I was observing made sense. Thank you. <laughs> it made sense. And another one, you did mention that Etia was a was a customs official. He was he was he was with the customs. Uh, yeah, he was a custom inspector. Yeah. That would also explain why he photographed the aduana. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. The one, the one, the one in French is aduana in in Spanish. Because he probably went there. He probably like yeah. He certainly went there. I mean, he, yeah, definitely. In as far as there's also Hippolyte Bayard, who lost ah, nothing. Ah, 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 ah. Hippolyte Bayard. Yeah, go ahead. To me, Hippolyte Bayard is the one true inventor of the yes. Because he is the one who understood how much of a trickster photography was yes. and what photography was actually going to do. Because all the others, Nibs, Daguerre, Talbot, were completely fooled by the realistic rendering of the image. The camera never lies. The camera, the, the photograph is an authenticated proof of the moment. They never saw the manipulating effect, the fictional effect of photography. Baya is the one who understood it very clearly. To me, he's the actual real uh, inventor of it. I wouldn't say, because he actually invented his own method. Yes which is interestingly enough, halfway between Daguerre and Talbot. It's a direct positive image on paper. Mm -hmm. So he has a method which is really halfway between the two methods. And he also fully understand what the medium is going to do. So to me, he's really the one who- He made the portrait of a drawn man, so he also invented the selfie. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's I mean, with one single image, it covers all the, it's like self, death, politics. Uh, I mean, with one single image, he covers all the topics that we are talking. Today, make uh, contemporary photography. He doesn't touch directly on gender, but he has a naked body. So, <laughs> so we... <laughs> uh, yeah. Hanfer, do you think that we could consider... Yes, there's a question, yeah. He's not, okay, Etie is not pictorial. I mean, to me, Etier is not pictorial. He does have a sense of composition, blah, blah, blah. I mean, he does, but the little bit he mentions about it is really about using the camera as an authentication or authentication of the experience. Uh, it's not about expressing his himself 
as an artist. Uh, even in that quote, which he does, in, in that line, which he has at the end of volume one, where he mentions eh, that there are few topics that fascinate scientists and meditative, meditative minds, and the phenomena of the daguerreotypes are among them. Even then, he talks about the medium from the perspective of phenomenology, not from the perspective of artistic expression. And the few other mentions, in particular in relation with the episode in Danau, is really done from the perspective of documentary. So um, I think, I mean, the, the pictorial concerns were there already anyway. I mean, we have pictorial concerns right away. I mean, <clears throat> the self-portrait as a drawn man by Bayard is a pictorial concern. He composes, create, set up a fiction to say something about himself, about his vision of the world. So I would regard the, 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 the self-portrait of, of the drawn man as a pictorial <clears throat> concern. Um, and there are other examples of pictorial concerns around that time. Um, even like the famous karyotype of the Talbot <laughs> of the haystack, although Talbot presented from the point of view, he talks about it from the point of view of documentary because he mentions there is no way that a painter could restitute every single, stra every single stra uh, strand of hay in the stack. The camera does it instantly without any problem. But the image itself, obviously, is really vehiculing a whole pictorial tradition. It is a visual medium, which is resting. The camera obscura was used by painters for centuries, and it starts making images with that background behind them. So they are necessarily repeating the rules of composition and so on. Um, but in the case of Etier, I think it's clearly, for him, it's the purpose of his using the camera really is documentary, not pictorial. I typed in a question, Gilles. So the question is, I'm going to read this for those who will listen to the podcast. So the question is, the nature of to which it is practice photography was in the context of commerce and industry. <clears throat> there has been some contemporary critics of photography that insists that photography is inherently capitalistic, wherein light is seen as a raw material of production. So what's your take on this? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm not really aware of those uh, critics. There's a lot from contemporary writers. There's actually a book published two years ago or three years ago, wherein it thinks of photography as a process of extraction. So you extract light from nature. And then from that extraction of light, you create capital. So in a way, what they're doing is that they think of photography as a way to extract nature or, or capital from nature, which in this case, the raw material is light. So- yeah, Okay, I think, okay, that makes sense. And I would say, I would say that it actually fits what I developed with my idea of, um, of white space. I don't know if you, I don't think you had time to read the paper <laughs> since last night. <laughs> that idea of extraction actually makes sense. But to call it capitalistic is I think putting a political interpretation intention to a natural phenomenon which is true, human society uses it in a capitalistic way, but to call the medium capitalistic because of the, it's used by human society capitalistic, I think is jumping, you know, it's like jumping, you know, it's, there are two different things, okay? It's a natural phenomenon as we saw that went it goes back all the way. It's, to me, it's part of an evolution that takes us into, we don't know what is, today in today's world, with all the social media, all the AI, all the blah, 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 the fake, but we don't know what is real, what is not anymore, okay? We are living, breathing images. And what we are doing right now is just that. 
we are living, breathing, talking images. Han Feng, I suppose, maybe you remember that in my very first lecture, I have, when I, the, the very first lecture of my history class, I have that definition of, definition of photography, a dark enclosed space with a little hole on one side that allows the penetration of light that produces an image. This is the pinhole phenomenon. This is the retina. This is the eye that allows us to see. Okay, so to call the eye capitalistic is I think because that information is memorized, that information is preserved, to call it capitalistic. It's capitalistic because then it's monetized. But in the happening of it by itself, it's not monetized. It's only at a later stage that is monetized. Okay, so it's not capitalistic. So I have that definition, okay? dark enclosed space with a little hole on one side that allows the penetration of light resulting in the production of an image. And then in the definition, I change one word. I change the word light by information. And we know in two days with all the quantum mechanics development, huh, we know that world, the world is probably made primarily of information. It's information that becomes matter. It's not matter that produces information. So it's Wheeler, the world as a self synthesized quantum phenomenon, okay? It's the exchange. The world exists through the process of information between two entities, two things, okay? So I change the word light by the word information. What do we get? A dark and closed space with a little hole that allows the production of the penetration of information resulting in the production of an image. We have the painting on the cave. The dark enclosed space with a hole allowing the product penetration of information in the form of a human being pro projecting an image on the wall of the cave. And if you push the analogy, if you in a bit of a far-fetched way, this is the very production of life. A dark enclosed space, the womb, that allows the penetration of information, the spermatozoid, that result in the production of a living, breathing, talking image, which is what I am with you right now. I am nothing but a living, breathing, talking image. So that's where I feel, to say that it's capitalistic, I think it's a very ma badly intentioned, <laughs> you know, it's like really trying to put politics where it shouldn't be. It's like, you know, like it's that, that kind of like, very uh, fashionable. Um. So that's a that's a very good point, uh, Jill. You mentioned a very important, or I guess an interesting intersection. Where in in a way, the way you explain it, there is no difference between semiotics and quantum theory. Am I am I reading too much on 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 my? I don't know because last night we were talking about Derrida. So he says that uh, there is that's nothing cool. beyond the text, or if we're going to appropriate what said, it's there's nothing beyond the image, and just like the, the way you said it. I am just an image to you, but we are a different kind of image. We are talking, we're living images. And yet, when we go to the, to the very fundamental essence of what we are, we are quanta, we are, we are quant quantum materials. And I think that's a very interesting trajectory of discussion of photography in the future, wherein there is a, there's an intersection of semiotics and the scientific physicalist theories of, of reality, an ontological conception of, of an ontological conception of photography wherein you go into quantum physics and also semiotics. So uh, well, uh, there's a there's a follow-up question from from Sergey. Go ahead, Sergey. Well, would it be safe to speculate that uh, the number, the, the relatively small number of uh, photographic plates that uh, ETF uh, produced during those times, uh, could, could, would it be possible to say that these were the only ones that actually made it, that, that, that were successful? No. Uh, I know, for example, I know of one box. Okay, it's a very, because yeah. in the process of the research, I got in contact with the whole family, uh, big family, because his son has had 12 children. So, and the family lo uh, sold the property, Veras, in 1968. And within two weekends, they emptied the whole, they basically emptied the whole castle. 
So it was a very chaotic moment. The plates that we know are coming from two sources. One is that when they, the family emptied the castle, they, they knew about the value of those daguerreotypes. So they did a draw uh, between a certain number of members of the family, whereby each uh, one, one person would get a box of daguerreotypes, one or two boxes. Okay, they, they were kind of like splitting the, the, the boxes between the different inheritance. But then it's not everything that was there in the boxes when they, after that they sold the property to the farmer and the farmer bought the property for the land, not for the building. And he left the building open to anybody. Um, and so for about 10 years, the place was open. The kids were coming in, playing like, you know, like when kids go into an abandoned building, they will start breaking things and so. And so when Gimon finally went to uh, Veras in the late 70s, he says that he found quite a number of plates on the floor. Some of the boxes had been opened and the kids had played with the plates and, and dispersed them on the floor. And then Gimon also contacted a number of members and he bought the boxes that they had with them. And then, thank God, those from China, the two boxes that made up the bulk of the plates down in China, went to a, a guy who, I mean, the son of, this, uh, of the inheritance, took them with him to Paris. He showed them to his friends. His friend said, oh, that's a, this, has, this seems to be very valuable, important. You should sell them to some people who would knew how to take care of such fragile, valuable objects. And he put an advertisement and eventually they were bought by the guy who started the museum of uh, the, the, the Musée Francais de la Photographie in Bièvre was started actually as a private collection and it became a museum later on. So that guy bought the two boxes from China that went into then into a public institution. <laughs> so all in all, there are definitely plates that have been lost, uh, that have been erased because of the conservation problems. Um, Olivier will know what I'm talking about during, because I did a presentation on Etier in Branly in April. And there's a guy who was mentioning that Somebody had come up with, a, I think because they were, the last sale that took place was about two, three years ago. And it's the daughter of Gimon who sold everything that was left from his collection. And in those things left in the collection of Gimon, there were a number of plates that were completely erased. And that guy mentioned that one of those plates had been by a what kind of process, we, we, we don't know. That plate had, had been very convincingly restored. And so apparently, suddenly, there was an image that resurfaced in today's world. So there are things, and there is that box. I know that there is one box that was shared between two descendants. And at some point, that box went into a family in Marseille, and it's lost. Very mysteriously, that box of the, the, the daguerreotypes seems to have disappeared. There are probably like internal things in the family that are just like, it's a bit of a bag of worms. Um, so hopefully there will be more images surfacing, just like hopefully there will be more images, who knows? As the biographer of Sidney Bado de Mas, who knows? <laughs> exactly. Because I, was looking, yes, I was looking at it from, from, uh, from the point of production because I tried making the genotypes and ambrotypes myself. Yeah. And then very difficult to make in the tropics. Yeah. So when we attempted the, the, the genotypes, I think of the 20 that we made, none came out actually. One almost there, but 19, 20 silver plates were actually basically. Uh, discarded because not, they couldn't be used. I never, yeah, I never tried myself. I met in the in the course of the research. I, I met with 
forgot his name, a French photographer who was using daguerreotypes extensively in the 80s for his personal work as, a, as an artist. And he explained a lot of things to me that were very interesting on how he was actually, he actually mastered the process very, uh, and he reproduced because there was an exhibition in 91 in Bordeaux and then 2012, the Bièvre Museum presented an exhibition with their daguerreotypes from China. And they commissioned that guy to do some reproduction uh, in larger format of the daguerreotypes of Vitié. Uh, but it is very tricky. It is... Um... I have a friend from France who's based there and he does uh, another ancient process. And when, we, when he went here to demonstrate it in class, Again, they also fail because of the because of the climate. The yeah. topic, the, topics, the, I do, I do, the question of the okay at the moment, my, my my last research is actually on the question of the again, yes. the first photo of the pyramid. Yes, the pyramids are that really like that quintessential archaeological monument. Okay, that that monument that sums up human civilization as a whole. Okay, because it's so huge and big and seemingly eternal, that it really sums up the whole of uh, human civilization. So I did a whole research on that question. It's like, at which point does the, the pyramid tip off? At what, where is the threshold for the image of the pyramid? When does the pyramid becomes part of the modern world? When does it leave? The, the, the past, I mean, the, 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 the classical world to enter the modern world. It is, again, a very interesting story, which is quantic. Because the, I presented the paper in, uh, in, um, uh, in Athens in June last year. I need to revisit the paper. I need to finish the paper <laughs> to properly send it to history of photography or whichever journal to have it published. It's one of the many things on my list, which actually answer your question, Anthony. Uh, so, <laughs> so, <a> project, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's the last question. So we need to conclude, I guess. Uh, we've taken so much of your time. So we're really very thankful for, for joining us. You see how when I started talking about it, I mean, I know. <laughs> so the last question would be, so given your situation right now, you're back in France, you're trying to finally or officially have this line of the first time that photography circumnavigated the world. And then there's another trajectory of your white space theory where we could see an intersection of quantum theory and also semiotics. So, so where do you go now? I mean, there's still so much to do. So what's your plan? Exactly. So take it one step at a time, take it easy and just let things happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... No, because I mean, that I've been cracking my brain and it creates so much stress trying to, uh, uh, you know? So now I've come to a little bit of a, I can only let it happen. I mean, I cannot like, you know? I cannot like, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, it's press myself with work. Although I never stopped, that has been a problem with me. When I, I realized that in fact, when I brought back all my archives from Singapore in June, in July uh, last year, no, in July two years ago, I realized that in fact I never stopped working. I've been, I've been making, 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 and um, mm. and it's not easy to learn how to let go, you know, how to, because now I'm at a point where there's just too many things to choose from, and by myself I cannot choose which one, so it's really a matter of letting it. Focusing on what needs to be done spontaneously. Okay, oh, I feel like doing that, and I'm doing that, and that's it. I don't want to. I don't want to intellectualize it because yeah. that's. I never did so. I, I, I'm an ex I'm an accidental academic as well. I never looked for a career in the academia. It's my friend Milenko, head of fine arts in La Salle who said, oh, uh, they all use photography, but they don't know what they are doing. Can you do a, a class for them? That made me start looking closely at history of photography. 
And then uh, two years later, he says, oh, I want to develop the photo program. Do you have a master? No. Would you consider doing a master? In fact, I didn't even have my BA. So he had to argue with the academic investor to allow me to do a master without a BA, okay? <laughs> so but I did a master, but then before the master, I had done that book, which I was telling you about Bintan, which was actually of a PhD level, except that it was done outside the academic context. So the master was actually, a, I would say a very, yeah, I knew how to write, I knew how to research. So it was all, all very much enjoyable. And then when I started teaching, I said, that friend proposed me to teach photo history in ADM. I never looked for it. <laughs> and never applied for the job. Okay. So it's all, you know, and it's a friend of mine who was, because in fact, in La Salle, I was part-time. It's a friend of mine who was, she was heading the PhD design program in Glasgow, who came to La Salle, Singapore to take over foundation. She loved the way I was doing things, the way I was talking about photography as well. And she insisted that I should become a staff. Because for me, the idea of a full-time job was like, you mean you only have like three weeks of holidays in the year? <laughs> you have to it up. Uh, and she insisted that I should be, and she actually fought with La Salle for me to become a, a staff. So I, I, it's, it's, I never looked for all this. It just, you know, so that's why at this juncture, I can only take it that way. I can only let things happen, uh, trying to plan, to conceptual, to, to structure. I mean, it's, first of all, it's having fun with it and finding pleasure in doing it. Um, like the way you asked me to do that talk, it took me into, and it, again, it's just like so-called coincidences, which are not. I agreed to that about six months ago, right? Yeah, yeah, it was six months I ago. I agreed to it about six months ago. Interestingly enough, two, three weeks ago only, like so like just before, I think two weeks ago, just before the talks, I think it's just before I went to Paris, so about three weeks ago for them. That paper from Noemi Espinoza came in. That was giving me a whole lot of new element for the talk. So the talk which I come, came to do today included a whole lot of new, like this guy, the Bertrand guy, which I feel seemed to be a possibly very interesting uh, direction to research. A guy advertised, because on that point, I mean, Noemi's paper is full of mistake. I don't want to sound <laughs> critical <laughs> about a colleague, but the paper is actually full of very simple factual mistakes, such as dates, the dates she gave for the arrival, in, for the departure from France, the arrival in Singapore, they're all wrong. No, the dates she gives in the article are all wrong. And I really wonder how the magazine, been, what kind of peer review they, they process or whatever. She says that ETA was a professional photographer, which he was not, okay? So the, the paper is full of mistakes, but she did very interesting research that gather a comprehensive overview of what we know, what we can know about the coming of photography to the Philippines today. Because until now, it was mostly, it was all going back to, uh, to, to, to Guardiola article. So it just happened and, and things happen to, to make it uh, relevant. So with that, um, I think we I have- I think we, yeah. I'm hungry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully we can invite you. I mentioned last night that hopefully we can- have Yeah, that would be nice if you could invite me to Manila. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'll, I'll, well, Sergey is here also. So we're part of the same department. Well, we'll think of activities you mentioned maybe in a year or- in eight months. I mean, I mean, like coming, giving some workshops. I would love that. Huh? I miss, I miss teaching. You know, I mean, my, the, the problem I have, like, I mean, I knew I had to come back to go back to France anyway, and I did it wholeheartedly. I mean, really willingly. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Everything, is, but one of the problems because I partly came back to take care of my aging mother who was in the home. Okay. Um, 
So one of the problems is that I was for 20 years, I lived surrounded by youth. And now I'm surrounded by old people, like really old people. <laughs> so I do miss teaching, you know, the, the contact with the, the, the younger generation. And the, uh, I do miss that a lot. So well, um, whatever we can develop, I mean, ideas can always, once the, once the need arise, poof. But Gilles, may, may, I ask you, may I ask you a question? It's already sorry. May I ask you a question about that paper? Yeah. Because I, I, I found it on the web in Photographica, uh, the, yeah. the French version. Yeah. And it, it, it seems to be a short term version. Uh, I've seen on, on your slide, you have the stamp at the back of the daguerreotype and uh, uh, things like that. They are not in the online version of their. Uh, no, the, stamps are, the stamps, hold on, tell me. Oh, merde. Ah, voilà. Hold on, eh? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Because, I mean, she very kindly sent it to me, so I'm. Oh, okay, okay. No, no, okay, good. So you, 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 you got to. Okay, let me check if they have, let me check if she has the stamps in it. So, Gilles, maybe you got a pre-read uh, more, uh, more uh, maybe uh, more exhaustive than the online version. No, she doesn't have the stamps in the article. Okay. She doesn't have the stamps. The stamps which I showed, there's a web page from Eastman, uh, George Eastman Kodak House. Oh, okay, good. There's a whole, there's a, there's a web page, very extensive page with the whole process of restoration I think the paper is no longer available online. Ah, uh, possibly, yeah, possibly. Uh, I, have it, I have it in front of me in French. Uh, and Which I was to download No, no, Javier, Javier is talking about the paper. It's not a paper, no, it's the web page on the oh, okay. restoration conservation process of the daguerreotypes. Mm -hmm. Okay. You are talking about the paper that Noemi just published. Yes. Mm -hmm. So she very kindly sent it to me. I'm very thankful for her trust. Which makes me feel a little bad <laughs> when I have to say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but Gilles, that's that's research, huh? That's research, huh? For me also, that's when awesome. I write, I mean, that's historical research. It's, it's normal. Yeah, it's, when it's, I when I do write something, I circulate it to friends also to get their remark and correction, and it's. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's so normal. I, I will have to write to her to say, "Well, look, I'm sorry. He was not a professional photographer. He didn't leave in January '43. He left in." December 42, he didn't arrive in Singapore in August 44, he arrived in July 40. I mean, you know, it's like very simple things. I important things. Yes. Completely uh, gets wrong. Uh. And her analysis is, ah, it's very, I mean, I really can't see how he would, I, he would have used 13 full plates to give them away. This mm. is just not possible. Maybe uh, one. Of yes. Remember, they were Americans. Sorry? They were Americans, so they could do anything. Yeah, but they can do, yeah, no, but I think, no, no, I mean, that they were Americans, but you, what, like they would have had the plates and they give them, the, give him the place to take the photo. Uh, there's no trace of daguerreotype plates to be in Manila when you, uh, Jimo mentions it, but I, I noticed there's, there was a, there's a mistake actually there as well. There's no trace of daguerreotype activity in 1844 mm -hmm. other than those two daguerreotypes by Etier. As far as I know, there's no mention of anything. There's no mention of material being on sale. Mm -hmm. So Americans can do anything, but to the point of using the bulk of his stocks of plates for their own personal pleasure. And Etier was not in the need of, uh, you know, as I say, maybe doing one or two by courtesy to thank them for helping them with his research, with his study of trading in Manila and everything. Yes, in those 18 places, there are maybe a couple from Itie, but to, 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 to give the credit of the old of 18 plates to him, I think this is just impossible. It doesn't make sense. Unless, um, unless the only camera they had took the larger plate, the larger full plates, full plates. Unless they, unless the unless the camera the Americans had were the larger full plates, and with well, historically the Americans love the preferred using full plates. Yeah, which is what the there's no there's no full plates in the whole body, in the whole known body of work. 
So why would the only yes. good place be in in a collection in Vanilla? I mean, you know, it doesn't it doesn't make sense. Also, the French town the family, the family, yes. So it's probably a little later. Even that in the article also, she has something, a study comparison between two engraving and two daguerreotypes that makes her say that the daguerreotypes are down before 1845. Um, but again, that comparison is very flimsy. She says things, I mean, you know, I'm literally sorry, it's, it's a bit, you know, doesn't, her, 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 her finding plates with French hallmarks is quite possible because at that time, I believe only France made it. Uh, it took some more years before America can make the plates. Exactly. Exactly. I fully agree. Point is that the, the, the stamp... We're all French. They are all French, but point is that there are all together... Hold on, where is it? There are one, two, three, four, five, six different stamps. So if there were all plates from ETA, he would have plates from the same manufacturers. He so wouldn't have plates from six different manufacturers. Do you see what I mean? Yes, yeah. the, the, the stamp is French. It doesn't imply that the photographer was French. That's because they were uh, putting it in America. The mounting was, the mounting was French. And in the website page from Eastman Kodak, they do say that there were extensive traces of later restorations and innovation that probably the, my feeling, my feeling about those plates. And Jonathan Best had exactly the same. When I was talking with Jonathan Best about that, Jonathan felt that those plates were most likely from wood because wood was working for that family in Hong Kong before coming to Manila. So Wood was in contact with them. And Wood opened a professional daguerreotype studio in which using a full plate would not be a problem because he would have had the supply, okay? So Jonathan was of, of the opinion that they were most likely from Wood. Judging by the handwritings at the back as well, because same thing again, there are six different stamps and there are at least three or four different handwritings and they are strikingly different handwritings. So how can they be, how can, how can, they, how can the daguerreotype present so many differences from one? I, I was also looking at the handwriting script. Some, uh, and uh, there's a distinct difference between how Americans wrote and how the Europeans wrote. Yeah. So they, they, they've been captioned by different people. They've been, in my, my feeling is that they've been photographed over a certain period of time, possibly by different photographers and that that guy was collecting them. And he took the whole collection to the States when he went back there, you see? Um, and there's, as I said, there might be one or two by Etier in the lot which he would have done by courtesy to that guy. But no way he would have done 13 full plates. It just, you know, the reason why he could photograph so extensively in Canton, and this is another important aspect of it, is because at some point of the research, I could come across the manuscript journal of Paris, who was the commandant of the steamship on which traveled the commercial arm of the mission. Etier was traveling by sailing ships with the diplomatic arm and Paris was, uh, Paris was a commandant. He was himself a, an artist. And when he left, he asked for the Navy. He was a, he was a military, eh? he was a sailor, a military sailor. He asked for the Navy to provide him with a daguerreotype thinking that he would use the daguerreotype to do photographic sketches that he would then translate into drawings because he's basically one of the inventor of maritime ethnography. And he was later on the first director of the Navy Museum in Paris, okay? So he asked for the Navy to provide him with a daguerreotype. What happened is that 
Very quickly, he just couldn't handle the technicality of the daguerreotype, and he gave the camera to a, another guy on the boat, Rondo, who then started using it. And that's why we have those daguerreotypes in Pondicherry that were wrongly identified as being done by Itier, by Gimon. Okay, so that's another whole story about the earliest dated photograph of India. It's in Pondicherry. Okay, so anyway, in Canton, Paris gave to Itier the a whole stock of plates which he knew he wouldn't be using. And that's what allowed Itier to do a panel because the panorama, the 360 degree panorama, has is done with 14 plates. Okay? So it's that gift from Paris of a number of plates which he didn't expect that allowed him to photograph so extensively in Canton. You think he would have used 13 full plates in Manila to give them away? I mean, that <laughs> doesn't make sense. So, so as of now, uh, Gilles, who, who can we attribute the the Manila the the uh, Manila the Gear types? It could be the Bertrand guy. I mean, I think okay. Pinaran, I mean, as she says, because when I was talking about this with, um, okay, when I was talking with with uh, Jonathan Best, Pinaranda hadn't been discovered yet. It's actually quite a recent discovery of those daguerreotypes by an identification of Penaranda. Um, and we know that Penaranda met with Etier in 1844, in December 1844. That's probably when he got acquainted with the medium. So Penaranda is a good candidate eventually because he could have worked, like somehow managed to get the full plates. I don't know how. Okay. And Wood is another good contendant. That Bertrand guy who suddenly surfaced in that paper we might never heard about before. That's very interesting. That guy who puts an advertising in the press, in the, hold on, the advertising is in which year exactly? Uh, oh, I need to go to the paper, her paper. I think the advertising is December 1844, okay? Offering his services in the press in Manila. Um, so that could also be something. If he was a traveling photographer, he probably had a stock of plates, which I don't know, I mean, it's all. I somehow have that feeling that it's not just the work of one person. The difference in stamps, the difference in handwriting, it probably means that it's something that was collided, compiled over a certain period of time with occasional photographer coming in. Yes, you're right, John. I mean, history is constantly in the process of being rewritten. So there will be, there definitely will be other, other names uh, uh, coming out soon. Uh, so, uh, so with the mystery- The mystery, mystery remains okay. intact and we will close on that, in my opinion. In my opinion, the mystery remains intact. Okay. So the to Itier, the whole lot of them to each year, just to me doesn't make sense. I mean, it doesn't. So with that, we have, I think we need to close. I, I think I, I, we've taken too much of your time, Jill, already. So uh, again, thank you for, for gracing us. I know I came out of well, nowhere, thank you. I had to email you, and then you were nice enough to reply to my email, and now we're here now. So we're very- Oh, when you first went, when you first wrote to, my, to me? What? When, when you first wrote to me, I, I replied in an hour. Yes, yes. Actually, uh, it felt so. Uh, now I feel so involved in the history of photography. I have to. I have to. I, I was able to talk to you. I was able. I, well, I have. I also have a co-faculty, Sergey. He is also writing uh, parts of the history of, of Philippine photography. He also teaches history of Philippine photography. And now we have you. So I feel so involved. And I thank you for for replying during like January. I think January. I emailed in January. And now we're here. So we're very grateful for that. And uh, this is not the last time we will, we will be talking. I hope we can have you either back in yeah, this I mean, the Smith or in Benil. So, as I said, I mean, I would be delighted to visit Manila to contribute to the yeah. development of some aspects of the program. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we can talk about that 
that I did. As, as I said, so probably later in the year, I mean, not right now. And because you said, yeah, that you would need to introduce the whole topic for the student, the fact that these three quantum mechanics and yeah. what is happening here. And, uh, and I also, yeah. And, and I also get, I also keep in touch with Olivier. He also. He yeah, also I mean, he's a very keen collector. He's not, uh, I mean, Olivier, how would you, I think you're mostly a collector, right? And that got you involved into researching and so on. Yes, yes, I am. First of all, I am a, I, I am a collector, especially yeah. about uh, uh, private photography and, and uh, postcards. And I got more and more uh, involved and interested in uh, vintage photography history. And, and as I, I said, <laughs> it, it, happens, it happens that my, my, yeah, my family is also half from Philippines. Philippines, so I, I, I do have a home in Philippines. So yes, <laughs> this is why you're so Your family? Your, you mean your wife, your family or your wife's family? Uh, both, in fact. My, 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 wife, my wife's family, sorry, my wife's family is, uh, she, she's Filipino, my children are... Uh, oh, your wife is Filipino. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Alice is a half... Uh, half yeah, she is. Uh, Alice is, uh, yes, she is. Cheers. <laughs> but uh, Anthony, ne next time I will, uh, when I go to the next time maybe I will drop you a mail if you can meet, have a drink in my or something, and uh, we'll, uh, yes. we'll let you know. Yes, yes. Yeah, ho hopefully we can, uh, I mean, if you can visit also the school, I can introduce you so, to yeah, CJ. Sure. Yeah, so. Uh, sure. I might be in Paris by October. Oh, so well. see you there as well. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yay. <laughs> okay, small world, a new a new network is unfolding. So that's why yeah. I said let things unfold of their own unfolding. of their own accord. And Fen, thank you so much. Yes. Uh, now I remember you. Sorry, in the beginning I was like the name was a little far. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Jules. Like, it's been a while. Huh? Uh, what was that Han who, who spoke? Uh, oh yes, yes, yes. That was me. Yeah. 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 yeah thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and hope to see you in Singapore in, uh, in, uh, in this August. I will have a show actually, again, things happening without even planning it. Uh, I happen to go back for an exhibition as part of the night festival on the last Kampong of Singapore. It's, uh, it will be uh, opening on the 18 in Fort Canning. All right. So, yeah. So let's, how is it going, your PhD? Uh, I'm doing my confirmation in the next few months. I've pushed it back a bit due to work commitments. Okay. And, and what kind of work do you do? Uh, I do a bit of uh, consultancy work and uh, a bit of freelance work. Still doing photography after so many years. So. Yeah, also, because you were doing the BA, right? You were doing the Yes, BA. I did a BA. Yeah. Then I went to La Salle for MA in art history. Okay. When did you go? Uh, in 2019. Okay, so yeah, that's when, yeah, 2019 is basically when I started, because I was doing uh, one class of photo history for the master in art history for quite a few years with Jeffrey. And then in the 2019 is when I stopped doing it actually because uh, I got busy and then COVID and blah, 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 and so on. So that's why I think I didn't see you there during that uh, 2020 was a bit of a 2020, 2020. Even even full time. Okay, <clears throat> okay. So hopefully we can catch up. Okay. So she's so pretty. Olivier, are you are you going to introduce us to your? I mean, you're you're on you're you're on mute. I think you were saying some something. You're on mute. No, no. Sorry, I was just saying. Okay, bye bye. This is uh, Alice. Hi. So she's half Filipino, half French, and my wife. You just so wife. <laughs> my wife, and she's from. Philippines. Can see Hello. <laughs> this is okay. so funny. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. That's the that's Bye -bye. the wonderful side of that whole of that yeah. duplicating energy. This is. Okay. I, I guess I have cut the. Uh, so okay, so I have to cut because I. I yeah, to... we have to leave. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. So I hope you enjoyed the the conversation. Uh, yeah, it was small audience, but enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. There there was an audience also in Facebook. So there was yeah. an audience in Facebook. Okay. All right. Okay, so, okay bye -bye. so with that, we close the show. Thank you, everyone. We leave it. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, bye. <laughs>